All right, it is 11 o'clock, so I'm going to get going. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's session on the importance of residential compliance. Um, my name is Danielle, and thank you for joining me in collaboration with CDS uh, this morning. So just as usual, a bit of housekeeping before I get going. Um, we are recording today's session. Uh, so if you'd like a copy of the slides or a recording, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after the webinar and we'll get those over to you. There'll be a short feedback survey that will launch after the webinar and we always appreciate you giving us feedback. Um, it's very, very important for us to get that from you as well. Uh, you should see a control panel on your screen, which allows you to ask written questions, submit them as we go along, and we'll either try and get them answered during or after the webinar, depending on how much time we have. And really, for today, as a summary of today's session, you know, today's session is going to go over kind of the basics and the foundations when it comes to compliance, particularly when it comes to the environmental uh, report and the aspects of environmental report in residential con uh, residential conveyancing. So if you are an expert or a long, well-established conveyancer, this presentation may not be for you um, because this is really going over kind of the very, the very basics. But if you're here for a bit of a refresher, then hopefully you will find this session helpful. So we're going to go through kind of each um, major environmental section that we would look at that, that is contained within our reports and, and do a little bit of a deep dive into what we look at. So let's get going. So we're going to cover all of these things today. Um, it's a fair, fair chunk to go through. Um, we know that not all of these have a practice note necessarily, um, but there is some guidance in the conveyancing handbook, so we're going to cover all of these, these off. And, you know, the environmental report, of course, is a small piece of a much larger puzzle when it comes to the whole transaction. As you're all aware, searches are a fairly small part of it, um, but it's definitely a, a key significant part because it can impact your client's enjoyment of the property. It can impact future plans for the property. It can potentially impact value, whether it's during the early negotiation stage or potential risks to the property in future, both environmentally as well as you know from a monetary perspective. So it's always worth reminding them that it's better to be safe than sorry when they are, of course, making the biggest purchase they're likely to make in their lives. And ultimately, we know you're always acting in their best interests, and we basically are trying to do exactly the same. So today I'm going to start with contaminated land. So, you know, contaminated land is a long-standing risk that needs to be taken into account in the conveyancing process. You, of course, have the local authority search or the CON 29, which contains questions as to whether an entry relating to the land appears on the local authority's contaminated land register. Now, it's usually a yes or no question. Um, so not the most detailed, not the most property specific. Um, usually the reply is a no. And this doesn't necessarily mean that the land isn't contaminated. It usually means instead that the land has not been inspected for contamination or that contamination is present on the land, but is not sufficiently serious to fall within the statutory definition of contaminated land. Now, the reality is that local authorities have designated only a small number of properties as falling within that statutory definition. Mo uh, most potentially contaminated sites have still to be inspected by the relevant local authority. And this is where a property specific contaminated land report is key in helping identify potential risks, especially as there is now no official government funding available to local authorities to help remediate contamination, which means that the responsibility can be inherited by a purchaser or current owner or occupier of, of that land or property. And so here we've, we've put for you the Law Society practice note on contaminated land along with a section that you can find within the conveyancing handbook. Um, I'm, I'm sure you will be familiar uh, with some of this already. So in terms of contamination and what it is, so we've put the legal definition of contamination on the screen for you. So this is a legal uh, definition of contaminated land when assessing sites uh, 
under part two of the Environmental Protection Act 1990, which is the legislation that kind of governs contaminated land. Land can still be contaminated, like I said earlier, but it doesn't necessarily meet this legal definition. Now, contamination can arise from a wide range of historical and current activities, like things like gas works, factories, garages, petrol stations, landfill sites, and all of these different uses can give rise to a whole host of uh, contaminants, including things like heavy metals, things like arsenic, lead, oil, tar, chemicals, radioactive substances in very extreme cases. And so one thing to remember is the older the industry is, the more potential it can cause risk. Because a lot of the time we'll get people to say, well, who cares what used to be there 50, 100, 150 years ago? Which is a very fair question and that's kind of a fairly common sense question. But, but back then, you know, all those years ago, there were basically no rules or regulations or legislation about how we disposed of waste. And so a lot of old industrial sites that have been purchased and then built over, um, means that basically nobody really knows what was under there to begin with, or nobody really remembers, and nobody knows how it was actually remediated, which means there is a potential for contamination to arise and resurface, which can happen and has happened over time. So let's take a couple of um, case studies and just have a look at sort of different examples of contamination. So you can see on the map, um, you've got that gray box, which is the property that has been searched against. So the pro this property was built on a site that you can see on the historic mapping um, is an extensive woolen mill with its associated works and a reservoir tank. So this industry has some of the highest classifications of past contamination. And this is recognized by the local authority as a high priority site for investigation and actually could be subject to part 2A liabilities. So that's the property. And now what's come up is the ground tour historic land use polygon. So that teal box is basically the extent of the whole, uh, the old industrial estate that that property is built on. So it's basically on that site. Now our historic land use data sets and, in, and industry use classifications together with information from the local authority about the site being identified for investigation meant that we actually spotted the risk early when we request part 2A information from local authorities, we request sites that have met the formal designation, plus those that are being investigated or categorized as a high risk, because we know that that can come back and kind of, for a better word, haunt you. Um, another report actually didn't identify this, and we were actually asked about it. Uh, another report didn't identify the former land use of this site, nor did they have any information which suggested that the site was even at risk. And it actually resulted in a pass, whereas in this particular case, that's not necessarily uh, the most, I'm going to say, accurate. Uh, because, of course, when one of their reports is obtained for the site, um, the client wouldn't have been made aware of this inf important information in that actually the local authority still deemed it as a high priority site uh, for investigation. And of course, that could impact somebody's buying decision, as this information is, isn't always commonly included in other conveyancing searches or uh, even in other environmental searches. So we do try and get the whole picture and the whole nuance of the situation, particularly when we're looking at contaminated land assessments, because it's really important to have that nuance and, and that information. Uh, looking at another site. So Due to the presence of former gas works, this property was investigated back in 2010, 2011, as part of the local authority's duties under Part 2A of the EPA in 1990. Now, the investigation found high levels of the chemical benzopyrene in the garden of 33 Nutfield Close, and as such, further assessment was needed in order to exclude the site from being designated as contaminated land. However, this further assessment actually hasn't been undertaken yet and the local authority still consi considers it to pose a potential risk and could still be determined under part 2a so again we're looking at potential risk here that now that's come up that's our historic land use polygon so again you know this is a bit of a tricky site you've got a lot of different things you've got tanks you've got gas holders you've got all sorts of potential things that could be 
uh, a potential issue or something that your client may have to deal with. Um, and so, again, not everybody goes and looks at all of this all of this information or asks for all this information. So when we request that part 2A information from local authorities, we, again, we request sites that have met formal get designation, but also those that are being uh, investigated. And you can see there's um, tanks and all sorts. And actually in terms of the property we were searching against, there was actually uh, tanks within 21 meters of the property and could potentially contaminated land use within 21 meters of the property and actually another report that was brought to us had passed um, whereas we actually flagged this up because we knew that the local authority had flagged it up as a risk and the investigations that were necessary hadn't actually happened yet so again so this is where understanding history and nuance and actually just making sure that you're being really thorough about what we're looking at from a contamination perspective is important. And so we cover all that within our reports. So when we talk about contaminated land assessment, regardless of what report you're looking at, you do get a full contaminated land assessment within a ground share environmental report. Um, we know that, like I mentioned earlier, the contaminated land uh, capital grant funding scheme has been scrapped. So the traditional way of assessing contaminated land risk has actually changed. And, you know, over time, just one type of historic assessment didn't really meet real world needs. And so with this in mind, we actually altered our approach uh, when it comes to contaminated land. We actually now provide a twofold risk assessment, which you get in every single report. So the first part of the assessment will be a part to a contaminated land liability perspective. And those are for really for very high risk sites. And we look at the history of, of the property, what used to be there and, and in terms of what, what falls within the legal definition. And then the second being land uses that could cause some contamination, contamination but wouldn't actually meet part two a but for which a homeowner or purchaser should be made aware of and would likely need to be addressed should a homeowner do any building works um, or if you know if you've got a client that's looking at property and they know they want to apply for planning or build on top of the property or add to the property because they will be responsible for cleaning up the contamination as part of their planning permission if let's just say it was found to be contaminated and the original polluter could not be found so that is kind of how we've adapted to people's real world needs over time, certainly in the last 10, 15 years, as um, more information and more data has come on, more nuance is required. Um, and I think we try and execute that uh, on you and your client's behalf as best we can. We try and, and make sure that everybody is just aware of what is there. And so from a co compliance perspective, like I mentioned earlier, this makes sure that we are in compliant with section B25.3 of the Conveyancing Handbook and the Law Society Practice Note. So just a really key thing um, as well when we're talking about next steps and guidance. So what happens if um, you know a report comes back and it says action required? Uh, of course, a lot of people tend to panic or I'd say the homeowner might panic. There is no need to panic at all. Uh, a lot of the time when we find a risk or a potential risk that we've identified, that doesn't mean it is contaminated, that generally means we need more information. And so there are various sort of standards at ways where you can try and get the risk downgraded. So the first being, if it's a new build or a property built within the last 10 years, then the NHBC certificate with contaminated land cover uh, will help us um, downgrade the risk when it comes to contamination. So if that's available, fantastic. That's one of the easiest ways. Uh, otherwise, you could go through planning. So if you've got planning conditions relating to contamination along with a discharge confirmation from the local authority, that will also help um, downgrade the risk and we can change uh, from action required to you know pass. Um, the third way of going around it is speaking to the local authority or the environmental health department within the local authority. So we have a set of questions that we can happily provide you. We can give you that list of questions. So if you want those questions, let us know. It's only about three questions, but basically we've got a set, set of questions we would ask the local authority. And depending on what the answer is to those questions, uh, we then would change or downgrade the risk when it comes to contamination. So a lot of the time, the stuff that has been flagged up, 
you know, I'd say more than half of them, if not more, are actually downgraded once we have the additional information. And the good news is if you do speak to the local authority and you send us this information, that information gets um, saved into our database. So if you do end up uh, doing another search for a property in and around the same property in and around the area, the next time it would pass. So, you know, th that's always really useful. And the more information we have, the better. And then, of course, you also have things like insurance, um, and some people choose to go down that route, uh, or in very, very extreme cases, like a phase one. So, of course, not all searches can be revised to a pass, um, but a lot of them generally are. And so all of the guidance and next steps is provided within the report. We're also happy to speak to you or even to your client should they have a lot of like technical questions or they have any questions that they just want to talk to us about. We've written the report, so we're more than happy to speak to them. So please also don't forget that um, should you you get a, a client panicking um, or, or a little bit worried or concerned about something within the reports, get them to pick up the phone, our phone numbers you know, on the bottom, get them to pick up the phone. We're more than happy to answer uh, those questions. So hopefully that gives you a really well-rounded um, view on the contaminated land section. And like I say, compliance wise, all the boxes are ticked for that. Next, moving on to flooding. So flooding is definitely another huge um, environmental concern that people have, and it's probably one of the ones we get a lot of questions about. Flood risk is one of the biggest, if not the biggest risk that we get asked about at Ground Show. We all know that flooding, flood risk is increasing and that we're running out of land to build on, and therefore we're looking at building more properties on areas that are prone to flooding or even floodplains or even at high risk of flooding. So we know that's been happening. So it's absolutely imperative that your client is aware of the flood risk to the property. And just because the property hasn't flooded in the last 10 years with the, ex with the increase in extreme weather events we've had, that doesn't mean the property is never going to flood in the future. So especially with long droughts or dry spells that we like what we've had um, this summer, then followed by extreme rain, you're, you'll get more flash flood events and surface water flooding events happening as well. I mean, if we're talking about flash flood events, look at what happened to Italy, which was in the news recently. So in terms of compliance, again, you've got a law society practice note when it comes to flood risk. And we, of course, take all those boxes, regardless of which environmental report we choose, because we think that it should always be covered in any environmental report that you choose. Um, and of course, you've got uh, the guidance uh, and the section in the conveyancing handbook when it comes to compliance. So in terms of compliance, all your boxes are ticked when we're looking at flood risk within our reports. Now, this is kind of in relation to climate change, but here I just want, wanted to show you kind of the stats on the slide. These are the total number of properties in the short term and combination of flood risk types. So river, surface water, and coastal. Um, those are the numbers of properties at risk of flooding in the short term and of course where we're going to be by 2050 in terms of increase and you can see on the graph the the real big jump is surface water and that's going to be the growing concern moving forward because as again we are running out of places to build as we're building more urban areas we're building in places places where let's say there's not so much soil that's going to be able to absorb water you're going to get a lot of surface water runoff you're going to get a lot of you know water pooling in places and so that is kind of the big concern over years and when we look at the last couple of years it, it's really just grown grown and we've had lots of instances of, of flood risk happening in, in different parts of the country. So in this particular area, this is the St. James area, after most of Northamptonshire saw between 40 and 50 millimeters of rainfall. Um, and this was back in uh, around Christmas time, December 2020. In the aftermath of the torrential rain, uh, St. James was pictured by hundreds of res residences teetering on the brink of a major incident. And in particular, the water rose to a foot deep at the junction of St. James Road by the Thomas Beckett pub. And several homes suffered water damage under their floorboards and gardens in nearby Lincoln Road were flooded. So um, this is the second time this area has seen a severe rise in water in two years. Um, after the junction flooded as part of a torrential downpour in 2018. So again, 
you know, these types of extreme events are going to happen and are happening more and more uh, with flash floods. And you can see on the right hand side, you can see the map and what the surface water uh, risk was to the area. Um, other events, we've had Christmas storms, multiple storms uh, in 2020. We had Storm Bella that impacted huge parts of Bedfordshire. Uh, we had other parts of Wales that got absolutely flooded um, as well with different, you know, different areas, like 78 flood warnings, 99 flood alerts. Wales had two flood warnings and five flood alerts, and that was just in 2020. So all sorts of different examples of, of insane kind of flooding happening and, and happening on the increase. But what can happen if you don't investigate flood risk? So this is a really old case, but actually quite a really interesting good one. So this particular property uh, was purchased in 2014. It was bought for 250,000 um, pounds. A year later, the new owners had the garden flood twice on two occasions and the basement flooded. And you can see the photo on the bottom right hand side. It looked like a lake. That was their garden. Now the sellers had actually ticked no on the TA6 form to say that, you know, had any part of the property flooded previously as you can see under environmental matters on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, they, so they took no. Um, but they did actually know about it because in 2012, the same thing had happened and they'd taken photos and then posted it on social media. And they were, they were of course caught. Um, and in this particular case, the purchasers applied for a session in, on the sale of the contract. And when you look at the map and you can see the, the border around the property, you can see um, kind of the red yellow color, that's the surface water that's within their back garden. That's the surface water risk. So you can clearly see it's, they do have a risk within the garden. And we actually checked our records when we found out about this case to see if we'd ever provided an Enviro uh, on this report. And we never had, um, not a combined Enviro or not a standalone Enviro. So this, uh, the, certainly on our, on our side, nobody had ever done a search on that. And so this is kind of what can happen. You can't, we know you can't always depend on what, the seller puts on the TA6 form. And so it's really important that flood is always included, which is why we include it in all our core reports. We also know that flood, you know, flood risk in terms of flood risk in the country, we are building more and more properties uh, on floodplains. We are running out of space. Um, there's a lot of pressure in terms of housing targets, properties are being built on floodplains and it's becoming more and more uh, common. now. Common sense would dictate that we should avoid uh, building on floodplains, um, but if we are running out of places, then we don't really have a choice. Um, we've had some of the analysis we've looked showed 200 permissions encompassing developments with a total of over 5,000 homes, uh, having been granted in local authorities where already more than one in 10 homes are at significant risk of flooding. So we know that the number of planning applications in flood risk, flood risk areas is still up. And we know that they're being done against the environment agency's flood risk advice. Um, some of the biggest areas impacted by this type of building is New Yorkshire and the Humber and the East Midlands. So that's one thing to obviously think about as well uh, when we're looking, particularly at new builds. Um, and Unfortunately, new builds are being built in areas prone to flood. So what happens when we identify flood risk? Well, that really depends on what we find. The risk assessment in our reports is based on the highest flood risk found within the site boundary. So we always suggest checking maps to pro provide it in the report to confirm whether the flood risk area actually affects the building or it's just the associate associated land. Um, depending on what we find, we'll provide uh, depending on the flood risk we find, so if it's groundwater flood risk or river coastal flood risk, then we'll provide guidance and next steps of what to look into and what they may potentially want to look into in terms of flood mitigation or confirmation um, from, let's say, the builder as to what's been done. So one thing to note uh, with new builds, uh, particularly, the data is the data. What what the environmental report will not take into account is any kind of private flood mitigation that a developer may put in place on a new build site. So 
if you are looking at a new build site and it's very, very high flood risk, because the data is what it is for that area, it is always worth going the extra step and double checking with the developer, um, whoever's built it, to understand what they've done in terms of flood risk for the site, because they would have had to have dealt with all of that uh, in order to get planning permission. Um, unfortunately, there is no centralized database for private flood mitigation measures. And so it's always worth just particularly for new builds looking into that as well, because it won't necessarily take that into account. Um, another, th you know, an example of guidance we would provide as well. So let's say we find groundwater risk uh, applicable to a property. So for subsurface structures, if the property has got a basement or cellars, then we would recommend investigating to see if the structure has been tanked because groundwater really only has a much worse impact on subsurface assets. So cellar tanking, basement tanking, it refers to like the application of liquid waterproof coating to the walls and floors of a cellar. And it's used to treat damp walls by preventing water ingress. So that type of practical guidance is provided within the report as well. And then in some cases, you may need something called a manual flood assessment. And that will be, a, that's basically a twofold assessment where we provide a um, more nuanced flood risk assessment to the external land of the property versus the actual dwelling itself. Uh, in some cases, uh, some people would, you know, some banks would like that kind of distinction. We also talk a lot about return periods within uh, when it comes to flood risk. So you might see one in a thousand or one in 250 or one in, you know, one in a hundred year flood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, rather than annual probability of exceedance or return period, the change of encountering a flood over a longer time scale can provide a more meaningful communication tool for a client. So as an example, if somebody's buying a house in a floodplain, which of course happens more and more, someone might ask you, well, what's the chance of a flood during the term of my mortgage? Assuming a 25 year mortgage, then there's a 22% chance that a one in 100 year return period flood might be equaled or exceeded. Now one in 100 might sound like quite a distance, but that's actually quite high. Um, or let's just say somebody says, I am planning on moving in a few years. What's the chance of a flood in the next five years? Well, there's a chance that there's a 5% chance that a one in 100 year return period flood may, may be equaled or exceeded during the next five years. Or somebody says, this is my forever house. What's the chance of a flood happening during my lifetime? Now, assuming the person lives for a further 60 years, then there's a 45% chance that they're going to experience a one in 100 year return period flood or greater during that time. So it's just kind of a way of communicating what this information means, uh, you know, in a relatable way to your client. It's not a perfect science, but it could just help explain certain scenarios uh, in a more relatable way. Um, for things like surface water, you're looking at very similar terms, but it also provides depths, depths of possible flooding. So like IE between X and X meters, but as always probability statistics and predictions should only be used as a guideline. So it's always well worth remembering local actions and minor variations, things like block drains or streams or privately built flood mitigation schemes can greatly affect flooding. And so just because an area has low or negligible modeled risk, that doesn't guarantee that the flooding is never going to happen, nor does that mean a high risk flood means that it's 100% going to happen. So it's a really difficult art, and but the data has definitely come along leaps and bounds in the last few years, and it's, it's becoming much better, and the data modeling is becoming much, much better for flood risk. And so as time goes on, we of course will continue to strive for better flood risk. Um, data. I mentioned earlier about manual flood risk. So this is where I say sometimes you will get a report that will have a high flood risk, um, but that high flood risk really only applies to, let's say, the external area of the property, the garden, or maybe the corner of a garden, but not the building itself. And so when that does happen, we can provide an MFA or a manual flood risk, um, which comes off the back of an enviro. And this basically shows you a more nuanced uh, twofold assessment uh, 
uh, when it comes to the report and the flood risk to the property. So it's not necessary all the time. It's not even applicable mo most of the time, but it is there just in case you get uh, questions regarding that. So when it comes to flood data, you know, from a compliance perspective, we satisfy everything in terms of practice notes and conveyancing uh, handbook guidance. We look at all types of, of flooding, river, coastal, uh, surface groundwater, flood defenses, areas benefiting from flood defenses and proposed flood defense schemes. We look at environment agencies recorded historic flood events. Um, and we also provide a flood score and a flood restatement. So for your clients that are purchasing properties um, in a well-known high flood risk area, then there is information that will be provided as to whether or not the prop property is going to be seeded into the flood re-scheme um, to help them get more affordable uh, insurance. So just bear that in mind. And like I say, if you have any doubt or any questions or your client has any doubt or questions, get them to call us and we will more than happy to uh, answer the questions. Moving on to radon. So radon during the conveyancing process, certain documents are used to ask questions about radon gas. These of course commonly inc include the CON 29, so the local authority search and the TA6 form, which is completed by the seller. Now radon appears under section 3.14 of the CON 29. And the question may be posed in different ways, but essentially it's asking whether the property is in a radon affected area as identified it by Public Health England or Public Health Wales. Um, the data commonly used in the CON29 is freely available and it's accurate to one kilometers. And I'm gonna touch a little bit more about this uh, in, the next you know, in the next couple of slides. We of course have the TA6 form. You're of course all aware of the, the phrase caveat emptor, which translates to buyer beware. As this form is completed by the seller, an element of caution should be exercised. Uh, the TA6 covers basically the following in section 7.4 and 7.5. You've got 7.4 has a radon test been carried out on the property and this is just a yes or no. If yes, then a copy of the report is requested as well as asking if the test result was below the recommended action level. And then you've got 7.5 then asks where any remedial measures uh, undertaken on construction to reduce radon gas level in the property. Now, the most precise way of identifying if a property is in a radon affected area is through, I would say, the data that you find in our reports because it's much more property specific. It actually provides a greater granularity than the data commonly used in a CON 29. We know that it's everywhere. If you aren't familiar with what radon is, it's basically the breakdown of uranium in soil. Uh, it escapes through the ground, it comes up, you know, it comes up from the ground, it gets released into the air that we breathe. It's not a problem if you're outside, but what can happen is radon can get trapped inside your home. And so building regulations covering radon protective measures for new dwellings in the UK were first introduced in the Southwest because that's where it is the worst. As you can see with the dark, heavy shaded areas on the map, you can see where the radon is quite bad. But when we talk about it in relative terms, if you're in the Southwest, it's always going to flag up as radon. Just like if you're in certain parts of Wales, it's always going to flag up for radon. Um, but this is where data is really important. So the, the data for radon has definitely gotten better. And with like your local authority search, the question regarding radon uses the one kilometer radon atlas, which is what you're looking at on the screen. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, but could it be better? 100% of course it can. So the one kilometer radon atlas shows the highest radon potential within a one kilometer square and applies that to every property within the square. So every property within the red square is within a radon affected area based on the one kilometer atlas, meaning there is an increased risk that properties will contain elevated levels of radon. And the percentage of homes in this area that may be affected by radon is estimated to be between five and 10%. So if you were purchasing or your client was purchasing a property in this area, um, basically they would get flagged up for radon, but, when you look at the more granular radon data set, it paints a much you know, clearer picture. You can see there's a lot of properties within that red square that are either in the area with no radon potential or a lower radon potential than five to 10%. Therefore, a local authority searcher, a CON29, using the one kilometer atlas would, get, would have given a radon of five to 
uh, which would have been applied to every single property within that square, whereas actually majority of the area surrounding the red square has no radon potential identified and are not affected by radon. So therefore a large pr proportion of the properties in this square you know, would be told to further investigate radon, radon when under the radon potential data set. So the radon data set that we use, which is much more property specific, we actually would say it's not necessary. And this is why we switched from the one kilometer atlas, which used to be kind of the industry standard to a much more property specific radon set, just because it's a lot, it's a lot more useful and a lot more practical when we're looking at property specifically. So just bear that in mind. And then when we, you know, when we talk about radon, we do provide guidance and next steps. We know that it has health implications. We know that it has potential increased costs um, depending on whether or not the property has been investigated and, and measured for radon. So um, there is a very quick, uh, I, I mean, it's not quick, it's about three months. There is a, um, a test you can do for radon if, if the property hasn't been tested, but it takes, unfortunately, it takes three months. And so sometimes people don't want to wait for that. So they'll, they'll go with something like a radon bond, um, which is retaining a sum of, of the purchase price to pay for any potential remediation measures up until the results of the test can be found out. And it's usually between 500 and 2,000 pounds. So, you know, it, it's not the end of the world at all. It's, it is, you are able to deal with it, um, but hopefully it doesn't alarm your clients too much. Uh, so just bear that in mind. And in terms of guidance and next steps, like I say, within our reports, it's always contained. You will always get that property specific uh, radon data and we'll give you what you need to do next, what the, the action levels are, and uh, what information your client needs in order to, to progress forward. Moving on to infrastructure. So this is where it gets a little bit, I would say more gray, because there isn't a pra you know, there's no law society practice note on things like energy infrastructure or railway, but there are, is some guidance within the conveyancing handbook. Um, so depending on where the property is, uh, there is some guidance in there in, in the conveyancing handbook in regards to particularly railways, um, looking into them, why why it's important to look into them. Um, I think it's kind of fairly, fairly self-explanatory, particularly in the UK, because there's a lot, there's over 15,000 kilometers of railways uh, in the country. Um, we've got the very old railway lines. If, you, if you're doing a lot of work in and around London, of course, your, your clients will already know and will want to know about that. But then you've got other big infrastructure projects like HS2, which are affecting certain parts of the country. You, of course, have uh, Crossrail 1 and then Crossrail 2, which, ha which has been shelved, but there are safeguarding areas, et cetera, et cetera, that have already been purchased by TFL. Um, local authority searches provides some information on large infrastructure, but the response provided tends to be very generic. It usually tends to be yes or no. One thing I have found, particularly for clients who are or in and around an HS2 area, we've had people come to us and say, my local authority search says HS2 is in the area, but your, your report hasn't identified that, why? And one of the biggest differences is within the local authority search, when it talks about HS2 particularly, it's just answering the question of, is there HS2 within the local authority boundary? So it could actually be nowhere near your client's property, but it's just it's just going through the boundary of the local authority. Um, and then our report will actually say, no, you're, you're not anywhere near HS2. You're actually like two, three, four, five kilometers away from it. Um, so it's not really applicable. Uh, so that may be at times why you might get differences in, in the responses or there might be a little bit of a discrepancy in terms of what our report says when it comes to HS2 versus what the local authority. So just bear that in mind um, when you are looking at the information within these reports. But I think it's fairly self-explanatory why people want to know about rail infrastructure, noise, vibration, you've got safeguarding areas, you've got compulsory purchases that was particularly relevant for HS2. Um, and of course, things like enjoyment, property, and access, we all know. And also, if you happen to live near railway lines, we also know that there's Japanese knotweed. Uh, the railway companies have planted a lot of Japanese knotweed along railway lines because it grew so quickly. Um, and in some case it cases, it has impacted clients uh, close by. 
So depending on what information we find, and again, depending on what your client uh, client's requirements are, you don't have to do this. You don't have to include it. But if you know that your client wants to either cover everything off or your client is, let's say, in London or is, is living potentially near areas where there are big, well-known rail infrastructure um, projects happening, it is worth investigating it and having it included within the report. And we will give you all the guidance and next steps when it comes to that as well. Um, moving on to energy, again, that's another one. There's no, there's no kind of mandate on it, no legislation. Uh, there's a lot of different types of energy infrastructure in the country, oil, gas, coal, solar, um, existing, current and proposed, nuclear, you know, so there's a lot going on, fracking. Uh, I don't know if you've seen recently, but in the news, um, there has been a fracking moratorium, which basically means that it was kind of banned or put on hold for the last couple of years, particularly due to its effects on potential or its potential effects on earthquakes. Um, and so that had been shelved and there hadn't been any new fracking licenses issued, but Liz Truss is to lift the fracking ban despite little progress on earthquake risk. So the, that was in the news, I think a week or two ago, first drilling licenses in nearly three years are expected to be issued as early as in a few weeks time, even though extracting shale would not actually solve the cost of living crisis or our energy issues. Um, so that will be one to watch if you do have any clients that are either near current existing fracking sites or old proposed fracking sites. Like we've got one down in Sussex. There's been a lot of protesting happening. Uh, people have concerns. So just one to watch as I suspect that will come back uh, in, in sort of the media awareness. Um, you've also got things like wind and solar. They're both very, very subjective. You have very differing viewpoints. Some people like them, some people hate them. Some people don't wanna be close to them at all. Um, there have been various studies done sort of in the last eight years to say whether or not being close to a wind farm had any sort of positive or negative effects on properties and studies have found both. There have been interesting case studies, a homeowner in Devon who was 650 yards from a wind farm managed to downgrade their council tax ban group and save themselves over 400 pounds a year because they felt the wind farm had negatively impacted the enjoyment of their home. And they felt they had lost about 100,000 pounds in their home's value, even though they weren't trying to sell it. And actually that decision was granted by the valuation office agency. Um, and then you've also got extreme cases where a couple who purchased a property in Cumbria successfully sued their conveyancer because development plans to build a wind farm were not picked up in their quote unquote standard conveyancing searches. Uh, the solicitor carried out what they considered to be normal searches on the property, but these searches did not reveal to the purchasers that, the wind, that a wind farm was about to be constructed less than a mile away and the turbines would be visible from the property. And the investigation found that the development plans were well known within the local community and local residents had actually led a campaign to block the plans, but were unsuccessful. And yet the buyers were not aware and had not been informed um, by the conveyancer or the seller. And so if the couple had known about the wind farm, they would have reconsidered their offer for the property. And subsequently, they decided to pursue a negligence came, claim against their conveyancing solicitor uh, and actually uh, won. And so again, very extreme cases, they don't happen often, but they do happen. So it's just well worth thinking about that and well worth asking your client the question if they are actually concerned about that type of infrastructure. So within the reports, you will find all of the infrastructure I've just talked about, power stations, energy, gas, gas, you know, grid network lines, et cetera, et cetera, current existing as well as proposed wind and solar. And if we have identified anything, you'll get the maps, you'll get the information about the project, you'll get to know um, who, who actually owns and runs the project and all uh, uh, will provide you with guidance and next steps on how to investigate and get more information on these projects. Home stretch, moving on to ground, ground stability and mining. So within the conveyancing handbook, there is uh, information, there is a section on mineral extraction and ground stability. Um, and when I say mineral extraction, it's important to note, not we're not just talking about coal, but actually really important to note non-coal as well. 
because non-coal seems to be one seems to be one of the lesser known um, and lesser investigated risks, I would say. Uh, so there isn't the official practice note, but there's this section talks about it fairly succinctly. And it basically states that a property should be searched to identify whether further investigation of site-specific ground instability risk is required. Um, so yeah, so even within the CON 29M, the Law Society guidance notes um, basically only relates to coal. So just, just don't forget that there is more than, you know, there's more than just coal mining in the country. There are lots of reasons to look at natural as well as non-natural ground subsidence um, we all know it's happening as well, happening a lot more, uh, over 10,000 claims totaling 64 million pounds. A huge part of Southeast England is impacted because we've got uh, lots of properties built particularly on clay, making them especially susceptible to subsidence. And it's an issue that affects thousands of house buyers and sellers and businesses. Um, and statistics suggest that up to 20% of residential properties in England and Wales could be running the risk of subsidence. Uh, when we talk about mining risk, so you know, we've, we hold over 8 million data points about past potential mining activity that could affect land and property. And these are all in addition to coal mining. And so the infographic that you see here shows the extensive nature of non-coal mining features uh, across England and Wales. And each of these data, data points identify an area of land that's been worked to extract resources over the centuries, majority of which have likely been infilled or covered over or built on, and they're actually not necessarily even visible at ground level. So when you look at risk, it is present, it is, you know, all around us. Um, and it's something that we just kind of have to, to keep, keep, our, keep in mind. And so depending on which part of the country, you may need a non-coal report, you may need a non-coal and a coal report, or you may need a non-coal coal and a Cheshire salt search. Uh, if you are doing any work in and around the Cheshire Salt area. Um, and just to give you an example, this is Pinnerwood School in Harrow. There was actually a mine found beneath the school. It's a really good example of interwar metropolitan expansion fueled by the expansion of the metropolitan line on the tube. Um, it sits away from deeper clay deposits found in the center of London, which means that chalk was actually really close to the surfers and surface, and miners therefore had a lot less trouble digging down to reach some of the minerals that they're after. Um, and so, yeah, much of the excavated area is actually built over with part of the shaft system currently underneath a sports field allotments and Dingles Wood. And uh, the chalk has been worked by a variety of methods and different types of mining methods. And so, Actually, laser imaging of the previously uncharted and unknown, tu unknown tunnels revealed that they stretched beneath the school buildings and that mine roofs had collapsed in certain places. So this school was declared unsafe and it was nine months before people could return to classrooms once the tunnels had been professionally, professionally filled in. So it's not just in, you know, mining doesn't just happen in certain parts of the country, like in the northeast or in the northwest. It can happen in places a bit closer to home. Um, similar here, this is in Plumstead, uh, very similar geological conditions to Pinner, uh, exists southeast of the River Thames. Um, again, Plumstead, Blackheath, Chislehurst all sit on the edge of huge, huge chalk outcro outcrops beneath surface gravel. Um, and actually, as far back as 1865, the Ordnance Survey uh, records brickworks in the area, but li little evidence showed actual extraction. However, by 1894, it's clear that the works have expanded and our historical maps actually clearly show signs of quarrying directly upon what would become a development area. And so, you know, unlike at Pinnerwood School, the issues at Brickfield Cottages probably could have been avoided as records clearly show the potential risk there. Um, so again, just bear that in mind when we're, we're talking about mining. Um, and other natural ground subsidence, so things like shrink swell. So we've got new maps launched by the BGS, which reveal how climate change is likely to drive an increase in subsidence-related issues for British homes and properties over the next 50 years. And so really, um, 
shrink swell and subsidence are going to happen more and more as we get more extreme weather. Uh, a lot of the country has, in certain parts of the country, have a lot of clay uh, in the ground. And what then happens with clay is that when it gets wet, when it rains, that ground expands. And then when it dries up and loses water, it expands. And of course, dry weather, high temperatures have been a major impact to uh, shrink swell. And anything built on top of a lot of clay will tend to move more. So some of the hottest, driest summers we've had in the last few years, and then followed by really wet periods, you can see where the problem lies. And so again, just an example for you in and around uh, the London area, we know that ground subsidence is going to increase again over time. And you know, it's, it's something that we're going to deal with. Um, same with issues like coastal erosion. Um, coastal erosion, depending on a, which part of the country you're in, it can impact properties greatly. So it is well worth understanding uh, if you've got clients who are looking to buy either a first or second home or a holiday home in and around the coast, it's well worth thinking about coastal erosion and, and looking at a report that includes coastal erosion uh, in its data. Uh, so again, depending on what requirements you have, we can cover that off for you as we do have a coastal erosion data set. And from uh, an overall property perspective, you can see the number of properties that are going to be impacted by coastal erosion in the short term um, with no active intervention. So again, within a report, you're going to get uh, maps, you're going to get explanations of the terms and what the impacts are and what the probability is in terms of uh, coastal erosion data. Um, so you're going to get potential erosion extents from coastal baselines for three time periods, 0 to 20, 20 to 50, and 50 to 100 years, and three degrees of likelihood, i.e. 95%, 50%, and 5%. And all of that will be explained and some guidance and next steps will be, will be provided as well. Um, and depending on what we find, uh, and I'm talking about ground stability and mining in general, depending on what risk we find within the report, we may give you some of these recommendations that you see on the screen, surveys, um, building guarantees, uh, on a, a lot of it will be to, to do with on-site visits. Um, of course, a survey will always trump a desktop environmental, so just bear that in mind. If, you, if properties had a survey done on it and the surveyor has been to the site and not actually identified anything, then that's great. Then you go with what the surveyor goes with. Um, when it comes to mining, again, depending on what type of information and what type of mining we found, we'll then provide all the information and next steps again. So just bear that in mind. And then finally, finishing on climate and climate index, which is a fairly new thing. And again, there's no there's no practice note on this yet, but it we know it's coming. Um, we have done a lot of work in the last sort of 12 months looking at climate change data and why we are actually are looking at climate change data. Uh, certainly from some of the research, uh, it is climate issues are something that certainly the younger generation are concerned of and millennials are concerned of. Um, back in 2019, it sort of all kicked off. 2019, 2020, so in 2019, the Bank of England and the PRA had released a supervisory statement regarding climate risk. And for, since then, the banks have been rolling out and developing high-level governance, strategy, policy, stress testing. And actually, as of the beginning of 2022 or early 2022, um, our three biggest lending clients um, actually asked us to include climate data within their report. So NatWest, Barclays, and Santander uh, asked Groundshore to include climate change data within their environmental report because we have a specific lender environmental report. We know that the Law Society is working on a um, practice note, so that will be coming. And so we're kind of ahead of the game by including this this here, this information already um, and making sure that certain reports are compliance ready depending on what your requirements are. Um, and in terms of, you know, solicitors and environmental law, Stephen Traumann's Casey, he recently released his uh, legal opinion on the duty of care that conveyancers have 
when it comes to informing their clients of climate related risk. Uh, we actually have a paper on that and we've got a summary on that full statement. Do let me know if you'd like a copy of that statement. It is also available on our website. It's a pretty hefty document from him. It's like 75 pages long, um, but it is all there and he's, he's gone into great depths talking about that. Um, we know that in terms of the banks, they categorize climate risk into physical and transitional risk. And so what we report on currently is physical risk, particularly flooding, subsidence, and coastal erosion. We're not gonna touch too much on trans transitional risk yet, but as the data comes out, as more information comes out, we will of course evolve uh, our guidance and next steps and the information that we provide. So with that, we have included climate index within some of our core reports. And this is really presented as a guide for any potential climate change impacts and enables this report, the report that you choose to be compliance ready in advance of future practice notes. So we've taken the primary physical risks that, the, that have been used by the Bank of England in their stress testing scenarios, so flood subsidence and coastal erosion, and created, awaited some algorithm to rate the impacts of these risks over different time periods. And it's there really to help provide the four points that you see on the screen. So for those of you who are familiar with our reports, you might have seen this new thing that's, that's popped up on the front page on some of them. Uh, the climate index, you know, so this is an example of what you might see in the report on a given property. The climate index has the time periods that we use, which are one year, five year, and um, 30 year. And these are the time periods in which climate change is modeled based on the Bank of England time periods for climate change. You've then got the overall property rating, which is applied for each time scenario as influenced by the changes uh, to each category listed and the six categories you can see on the screen, which are different types of flooding, ground stability, and coastal erosion. And then you've got variance, which is basically the actual changes. So the difference between the different time periods and how they increase or decrease or no, you know, don't increase at all. Um, and so again, uh, this is all uh, based on RCPs, which are, are in various emission scenarios. It's all done by um, UK modeling and U UK CP18 climate prediction models. So it's all very scientific. I had nothing to do with putting it together. Much smarter people did, <laughs> um, um, but it's all there to try and help uh, provide a, an idea of risk. So again, you know, we do provide guidance and some next steps, um, particularly when it comes to climate risk. It's kind of already folded into the guidance that we provide for flooding, ground stability, uh, and coastal erosion anyway. Um, and just bear that in mind when you think about things like insurance, you know, insurance companies are using climate predictive models already. Um, flood data modelers are looking at this as well. It's really a huge part of it is flood, um, but it is something that we'll, we will continue to grow and use and improve. And so again, it really just depends on what you and your clients need. So we like to think of it as what are your compliance requirements? You, you want the minimum basic, um, the standard, compliance or maximum compliance. And depending on what you want to cover and what your client wants you to cover, so again, the option is always yours, you can then choose reports based on um, uh, your compliance requirements. And so if you want to know more about the different, different reports, then please do either reach out to me or reach out to your preferred account manager um, at CDS they will know all this anyway and they can make the right recommendation for you so and you and your clients but we want to make sure that you're comfortable and you're aware that you have all these options i hope i have not inundated you with too much information it was a lot to go over but thank you if you have stayed thus far um and that's it for me today if you've got any questions at all or if you want a copy of the recording or a copy of the slides let me know um we really appreciate your time and there will be a quick survey popping up straight after this. So thanks very much and have a great rest of the afternoon.